little introduction about Anne. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Kansas State University in 2006 and was hired at Sedgwick County Zoo a year later as zookeeper. She is now curator of birds at Sedgwick County Zoo. She holds many roles in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, animal programs. She's been involved with the Mariana Avifauna Conservation Project since 2017. This project works to protect endemic and endangered avian species in the Mariana Archipelago. In addition to her conservation work in the Marianas, Anne is involved with North American songbird conservation in Kansas through the Kansas MODIS network. She's also an adjunct professor at Friends University, teaching the management of zoo birds course. Let's welcome Anne Hyman. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight to hear me talk to you about avian conservation in the Marianas Islands. Um, like Mark said, I am curator of birds at Cedric County Zoo. Um, however, this is not projects that I have started or anything. Um, I just want to preface everything that I'm going to talk about tonight. There's no way that I can list every single entity that has been involved in these projects. I will do my best. So please don't think that these are just Cedric County Zoo projects or anything like that. We are partners in these amazing efforts going on out there. So, um, in case you are unfamiliar, um, we do have several exhibits at the zoo that feature some of the birds that we work with in the Marianas. We have the Coco down here, or the Guam Rail, and the Sea Heck up top, or the Guam Kingfisher. Yeah. Could you use the mic? Um, sure. sound system in here got destroyed by a lightning strike and so they're using this portable thing. Yeah, that sounds like something that would happen at the zoo. <laughs> Switch, you have to press and hold. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. oh, there it goes. Can you hear me now? Testing, testing. Testing. Mic check. Okay, how's that? Okay, great. All right, so. I do want to, um, before I jump into talking about the conservation projects themselves, I wanna take a minute to talk to you about the people of the Marianas Islands. Um, the Chamoru, or Chamorro, um, depending on which government entity we're talking about. Um, both spellings are acceptable. The Chamorro spelling with the capital C, capital H um, is recognized by the government of Guam and the Chamorro spelling is recognized by the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Um, either way, it's the same group of people. They are indigenous to the islands out there. Um, and then in the early 19th century, um, the people from the Carolyn Islands, the Refaluwash people, 
um, migrated out to Saipan. Um, they have a long <laughs> history out there of intermingling and division, and so we do, while we're working out there, we do use the Chamorro names for the birds. And we'll also use the Carolinian names for the birds. I am only going to be using the Chamorro names tonight, um, but when you, I will try to make sure to remember to tell you the English names as well, but um, I just wanted you to know I am going to be using some of the Chamorro names. Okay, so usually when I start to talk to people about the conservation work that I do, and I say that I work out in the Marianas Islands, most people go, where's that? And I have to admit, when I started working <laughs> at the zoo and I heard about the project, I was like, where's that? Um, so, you can see up here in kind of the left-hand side, this little orange line, that's the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean, right? Inside that trench is the Mariana Archipelago. And zooming in, you can see, well, you can barely see the islands in that little red box. Um, so that's why we have the inset there. But um, they are south of Japan and east of the Philippines and right above those Carolyn Islands right there. And then just a better look at the island chain itself. So Guam is the southernmost island. It's also the largest island. It is the most populated. It is its own government. It is a territory of the United States. Everything north of there is the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. You will hear me refer, refer to them as the CNMI um, because it's a long mouthful. That is a commonwealth of the United States. So don't ask me the difference. I don't know, but they're all American <laughs> citizens. Um, and no, they do not have representation. So um, why do we travel from Kansas to go work on these little tiny islands out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Why are we so concerned about the Marianas Islands? That's because of this guy. This is the brown tree snake, and it is native to Australia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. Um, the first sightings of the tree snake were in the 1940s, 1950s, shortly after World War II. Um, if you are a history buff, you know the significance of the islands of Sinian, Tinian and Saipan um, in, the world, in the war. Um, Tinian is where the Enola Gay took off with the bombs that bombed Japan. Um, the Marianas Islands continue to be a very important strategic location for the U.S. military. Um, all four U.S. military branches have or are going to have presence on Guam. Um, but that causes political issues when it comes to conservation. But we're here to talk about the snake tonight. Um, they believe it was an accidental introduction. Nobody meant to bring the snake to the islands. Um, it is arboreal and nocturnal. And that spelled out disaster for the forest birds on an island chain that evolved with no predators that were nocturnal and arboreal. Um, it is specifically designed to eat bird eggs, nestlings, adults, and also lizards. So by the time people noticed what was going on on the island, 10 of the 12 native forest birds on Guam had been extirpated from the island. Um, and before we could react and um, gather up the last of every bird that was left, um, one of their endemic species did go extinct. The Guam flycatcher was unable to be brought into captivity. However, um, they were successful in collecting sea heck and cocoa, which is how we have those programs today. Um, Guam in and of itself has a lot of research going on currently today into the effects of losing all of your birds um, in an ecosystem. Um, one of the things that they've noticed is that um, a project out of Rice University back in 2012 found that um, as many as four times 40 times as many spiders were present in Guam's forest than on the nearby islands. So, um, but it's also really moving when we're out in the islands and we speak to somebody from Guam 
who has traveled to the Northern Islands. Um, and we take them out into the forest to see the birds and they are just kind of quiet and reflective and you know, you say, how's it going? And like, Guam is silent. And they don't, they don't hear birds when they go into the forest. So um, it's always something that we don't take for granted when we're doing the work out there that this is really important and this is why we're doing this work because this ecological disaster um, affects the people on those islands. They didn't ask for that. So um, we are doing what we can to fix it. So I am going to talk to you about, well, two, three programs um, that the Cedric County Zoo is involved in tonight. These first top two that are highlighted in yellow. Um, but I also want to speak a little bit about some of the other projects going on in the islands because there's more going on out there than just what we're involved in. So um, the CHEC and the COCO are both projects to um, prevent those two species from going extinct. So they were both collected from Guam in the late 80s and brought into AZA zoos in order to breed them with the goal of reintroducing them to Guam um, while work was done to eradicate the snake. Um, this is overseen by US Fish and Wildlife Guam's Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources, and SCZ's own President and CEO, Scott Newland. Um, he is the AZA um, point person for the program. So um, he oversees all of the, the captive side of it and um, the breeding and things like that. Then we have the Marianas Avifana Conservation Program, which is what the project that I am more involved in personally. Um, again, efforts to prevent population decline um, and, and or extinction of the native forest birds, um, but in the Northern Islands. So biologists in the Northern Islands have seen what's happened on Guam and they're very concerned that the snake can come to their island. Um, so far there have been 90 confirmed sightings of the brown tree snake on Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda. Um, the good news is, is the last live sighting was in 20, or 2006. Um, so they feel like their port control programs are working really well. Um, there's entire teams that th their whole job is to prevent brown tree snakes from coming into the islands by searching everything that comes in, especially by boat. Um, they have special snake sniffing dogs that they use instead of you know like drugs and bombs and things like that um, these dogs are trained to sniff out the snakes um, it's really cool when you land the dogs come along and they sniff your luggage so i'm sure they're sniffing for other things too but. um the mac program is what i'll call it instead of saying that whole long name um instead of reintroduction what we're doing is establishing assurance populations on the uninhabited islands. Um, so the islands that don't have regular commerce with Guam, because very few people live up there. Um, we say they're uninhabited. There are homesteaders that live up there for part of the year, um, but um, it's not regular trade going back and forth. Um, another goal of those assurance populations is um, to establish populations on other islands in case of um, severe weather and with climate change, we're seeing more and more severe weather. Um, and so the typhoons that have been hitting the Marianas Islands recently have been, um, they've been lucky to have avoided some of the worst of it, but um, you know, the next one's always around the corner. So if we can have populations on multiple islands, we're you know, just not putting our eggs in one basket, right? Um, and that project is overseen by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but only the listed species. Um, and then the CNMI's Division of Fish and Wildlife and Pacific Bird Conservation, which is a nonprofit organization that was started by two bird curators from AZA zoos. Um, and it is entirely staffed by volunteers from AZA facilities, um, which is where I come in. Um, but also going on in the island is the aga, which is the Marianas crow. 
which was originally found on Guam. Um, right now it's only found on Rota. Um, there's a project overseen by San Diego Zoo that is working on monitoring the population on Rota, but also working on captive breeding um, to help bolster that population. And then the Ecology of Bird Loss Project, it's that same project I was referencing before about the spider studies. Um, this is overseen by Dr. Halter Rogers, who's currently out of Virginia Tech, uh, but she's doing research on the ecological consequences of losing birds in your ecosystem. So they really focus on things like seed dispersal, um, predation, pollination, and introduced mammals. So, Cedric County Zoo is not directly involved with the Ecology of Bird Loss Project, but through our work with Pacific Bird Conservation on the MAC project, um, we do help them collect samples, especially for their seed dispersal and their pollination studies. So we have the birds in hand, we might as well get the samples for them at the same time. So. All right. Jumping into Guam Sihik. Guahan is the Chamorro name for Guam. Um, if you've been paying any attention to the Cedric County Zoo's social media page in the last month, you might have heard us talk about this bird a little bit. Um, major conservation news for this little guy, right? Um, as of last month, we now have nine Guam sea heck living in the wild. So um, it's very, very exciting. Um, a little project background. So, you know, I said earlier, the last of the sea heck were brought into captivity in the 80s um, with the goal of breeding up enough birds for reintroduction. Um, because of constraints at zoos, um, you know, we only have so many resources, so many holding spaces, so much staff. Um, we've kind of hit our carrying capacity for this population within AZA. Um, we're sitting at about 130 birds at 25 different institutions. Um, they don't play well with a lot of other things, so they're hard to mix in with other birds. So it really limits where you can house them. So it limits spaces for them. Um, so while we're reaching our carrying capacity, um, which is great, because that means we've bred a lot of birds, um, they've been working on getting rid of the tree snake on Guam. Um, many, many attempts to do that. Um, there were um, baited prey drops, traps, um, nightly hunts to go out and catch snakes, um, and those efforts have made a dent. Um, the snakes that they're finding are smaller. They're not finding the big mature snakes like they used to. Um, they, the traps that they're having at all the airports and everything are working really well. However, no one said this officially, but when you talk to people who are working out in Guam, you know, nobody wants to say it, but you kind of get the vibe that maybe we're never really gonna get rid of the snake on Guam. So, Focus is now shifting to establishing snake-free zones um, by putting up snake-proof fences and creating areas of habitat that we could potentially release sea heck into. Um, we wouldn't just release sea heck right at the very beginning. We would try with other things first, but um, those habitat spaces are um, being built right now and being tested. So. Um, because we're kind of making forward progress on that, and because you know zoos are running out of room for sea heck, um, the project has really picked up speed in the last five years to make concrete steps towards reintroduction. Um, so, but we can't put them on Guam, so where are we gonna put them, right? Um, the project decided to pursue creating a 10J population, which is just the um, section of the um, Endangered Species Act that a 10J population does not count towards recovery of the species. It's an experimental population. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife will never consider the birds living on Palmyra to be um, wild Guam kingfishers because they're a 10J population. So how did we land on Palmyra? 
because Palmyra is way out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, just south of Hawaii. Um, similar habitat to the Marianas, but if you're gonna, you know, why wouldn't we pick Yap or one of the, the islands closer to the Marianas? Um, well, Palmyra is one of the healthiest and most pristine island ecosystems on the planet. Um, thanks to decades of restoration work by the Nature Conservancy, who um, owns and oversees the island. Um, and they volunteered to let us put the birds out there. Um, there were several studies and surveys that went into the um, decision-making pro process. Um, biologists went out there, um, Scott Newland went out there, and looked at the island and really assessed is the right kind of prey available? Will the sea hack have any sort of adverse effects on the birds and other animals already living on the island? Um, which, apart from the prey items, um, they decided no. Um, there are a lot of seabird colonies there, but there's no other kingfisher, um, not any bird that's um, going to be filling the same niche as this kingfisher. So, Palmyra it is. So now, what, what birds are we going to send out there? And all of us AZA people are like, whoa, we've got all these kingfishers that we would you know, love to send out there. Um, because Palmyra is such a pristine and biosecure island, um, there's intense like, biosecurity and rules just to even set foot on the island as a person. So they weren't real keen on us sending out our zoo birds. Um, so the IUCN specialists, the Nature Conservancy people, AZA, all agreed on raising chicks for these releases, um, which, oh, okay, that sounds easy. It's not when <laughs> you're working with several zoos around the country having to get their eggs, their fertile eggs, to a biosecure facility, not have something go wrong in that incubation process, and then get the chicks to hatch and raise them ready for release in a quarantined environment. But we did it. Um, the biosecurity unit was built at Cedric County Zoo. It's behind the scenes. Um, it's chosen for a couple reasons. One, it's not that expensive to build things in Wichita, Kansas compared to other places. Um, and we're centrally located for the zoos that are our partners in this. So it was easier for people to get all the birds to us rather than asking everybody to send their birds to Orlando or something like that. Um, and the facility was staffed, is staffed um, by AZA and um, ZSL, the Zoological Society of London. Um, it's all just bird keepers in there. Um, ZSL got involved through IUCN um, and their species recovery um, programs, they've gotten involved and they said, hey, we have people to send out to you. And we said, great, the more hands, the better. So um, we did raise birds in 2023. However, we didn't raise enough birds in 2023 to warrant getting the birds out to Palmyra because it's a really expensive plane ride and we wanted to make sure that we were using our resources wisely. Um, so, this year was the year though, and they took nine birds out. So, yeah, just last month, um, they went to Palmyra. Dr. Heather Arns is in the room. She accompanied the birds to the island, so you can bug her after if you want to ask her all sorts of questions about Palmyra. Um, but they traveled via the Nature Conservancy's private charter jet, and that's important and not a brag. And <laughs> that will make sense when I talk about Coco. Um, the birds were kept in pre-release aviaries on the island that were built by your very own Jeremy Burkett. Um, so you know, be sure to bug him the next time you see him to tell him tell you all about Palmyra um, and one of my staff members um, and some other people on the island as well. Um, in those aviaries, they made sure that the birds were transitioned from their captive diet to the live prey there on the island. Um, we've gotten lots of great footage of them out collecting all sorts of live prey in the dark in the morning to give to the birds. 
Um, once they were feeling comfortable that everybody was eating live prey, which happened really fast, um, I was impressed with the speed that these guys picked all that up. Um, they got another set of health checks, they had their transmitter backpacks um, tied on, and then they were released um, just a few days later. Um, they were very careful in the order in which they released the birds based off of personality. Um, and just a funny little anecdote, in true kingfisher fashion, the very first three birds that were released all managed to fly over to one of the other aviaries because they were kind of spread around the island. Um, and they were heckling the other birds who were still in their aviaries. And we all just thought that, that was really funny. Um, but all nine are out, they're doing great. There are two biologists who their whole job is to just monitor the sea heck. So they just get to walk around the jungle all day doing telemetry um, and sending us great pictures and video and taking lots of data on these guys. So um, in fact, there's a photo of one of our little girls out there. So sea heck are in the wild, even though they don't count technically <laughs> towards recovery. But um, this is one of those things that I wasn't sure I was going to see in my career in the field because it just didn't seem like it was ever going to happen. And it did. So um, really, really amazing stuff. Okay, switching over to the Coco. Um, this is an adorable little Coco chick and its parent at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Um, one of our partners with both Coco and CHEC. Like the sea heck, the objective of this program has always been to reintroduce the birds to Guam. Um, we have a much smaller population in AZA um, right now, and then there, there is a breeding facility on Guam um, that is, you know, snake proof. Um, they have a lot more birds out there. In many ways, this project is a lot farther along than sea heck is. Um, because the rail didn't have a bird in the Marianas that would compete with it on the other islands, they were able to start introducing the rail to other islands a lot sooner than we were with the sea heck. Um, there is a collared kingfisher that lives on the northern Marianas Islands, which is why those islands are just completely out. We can't put the sea heck there. So, um, yeah, only a few years, I think it was like 1989 even, was the first release of rails onto Rota. Um, which was, is believed to be snake free. There's only been a few sightings of the, the snake there. However, it has its own other issues. You know, there's dogs, cats, things like that. So regular releases of rails to Rota um, were ongoing through the 90s, early 2000s. In 2010, they also released a small group of birds on Isla Gano or Cocos Island. Um, which is a tiny little day resort island off of the southern coast of Guam. So it's that little red square at the bottom of Guam down there. Um, but you can see there's a little touristy area, uh, but there's a lot of great forest there too. Um, and they released like less than 20 rails there. Um, and they believe now there's like 60 to 80 on um, Islandano and about 200-ish on Rota. Um, so following that final rota release in 2017, they'd seen breeding. Um, they were starting to feel like the population was getting to a point where it might actually be self-sustainable and that releases could be tapered back off. Um, and so U.S. Fish actually down, downlisted it from extinct in the wild to critically endangered um, in 2019, which was huge news. Um, and then the world shut down the next year. So there's been some challenges with Coco lately. Um, Isla Dono is probably at its carrying capacity for rails. It's a tiny speck of an island. So if that population is going to maintain, great, but it's probably never going to grow bigger than what it is. Um, we're also having some issues getting rails from the mainland to Guam and vice versa, because we were routinely moving birds back and forth to make good genetic pairings. Um, 
Actually, pre-COVID, uh, United Airlines shut down live animal transfers on their airline, and United Airlines is the only carrier that gets us out to Guam from the United States. So we no longer have a commercial option to get birds out to Guam, which is why that private jet for the Sea Heck was so awesome. Um, so does anybody have a private jet? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, but also COVID relating staffing and budget shortages and all those things kind of put a damper on breeding both at AZA and on the Guam facility. So it's kind of taken a pause really for the last few years, but I've noticed with all this sea hick stuff going on, there's a lot more talk about cocoa and how can we get birds going. And so I think we're going to get going again on that project really soon. So. Um, very exciting. Step number one would be a comprehensive survey of Rhoda to see how many birds are still out there. So, Alright, so last project, the one that I can talk about for several hours, so please cut me off if I to go too long. <laughs> so the MAC program. It's a collaboration between the government of the CNMI, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, AZA Zoo's Pacific Bird Conservation. Um, and the goal of the program is to provide the avifauna of the Mariana Archipelago with the best possible chances for long-term survival. It's like, okay, great, cool, what does that mean? Well, a little background. Um, I'm gonna kind of reiterate some stuff I already talked about for you. Um, but in 1993, um, there was a project called the Mars Project, or the Mariana Archipelago Rescue and Survey, um, which really was doing a lot of population surveys and some translocation and some propagation stuff. So it was really the beginning of the work with the Mariana Crow, or the Aga. Um, Rota White Eye and the Mariana Fruit Dove were first brought into captivity at that point. Um, the Rota White Eye population went south fairly quickly, but um, we still have fruit doves in, in zoos today. Um, after that, and continuing on today, because I already talked to you about them all, are the Aga, the Cocoa, and the Sea Heck projects. Um, but it took all the way up until 2006 for something to get going with a little more concrete efforts for the forest birds of the CNMI. And that's where the Mariana Avifauna Conservation Project came about. So the Division of Fish and Wildlife in the CNMI had worked with um, these two bird curators um, in 1993 on that Mars project. And they were like, hey, you want to come back out and help us do some long-term translocation stuff? Um, and they were both reaching retirement. And they were like, yeah. Um, so that was Peter Luscombe of the Honolulu Zoo and Herb Roberts of the Memphis Zoo. They're both now retired and they founded Pacific Bird Conservation. And we've been working out there ever since. So um, we focus on the current plan anyways, we're in the middle of revamping the plan. Um, but the nine endemic Mariana Island bird species. So um, the Palamon Totot, which is the Mariana fruit dove, Palamona paca, um, which is the white-throated ground dove. We are not translocating that bird because um, it has a very strong presence on multiple islands already. Uh, Gaga Carisu, which is the Saipan reed warbler. Um, my slide is wrong. Canario, golden white-eye, Nosa bridled white-eye, Nosa luda, which is the rota white-eye. Luda is the Chamorro name for rota. Chicharica tinian is the tinian monarch. The Aga, again, we don't work with that one when what we do, but it is in the endemic bird list. Um, and then the Cha Cha Guac is the Mariana Swiftlet. That one is technically on our list to do, and uh, whew, that one's gonna be fun because they live in caves up on the plateaus on the island, and you have to climb cliff sides, and I'm not gonna do that. Um, and then we also work with the Nabok, which is the Rufus fantail. Um, this is not um, endemic to the Marianas Islands. Um, however, there have been some recent taxonomy changes, and now they're saying it's a subspecies and whatever. But 
Um, they are fun little sassy games. Our project has three main objectives. Um, number one, to establish breeding satellite populations on sanctuary islands via translocation, provide public outreach and education on the islands, and to create captive assurance populations in AZA zoos. And I'm just going to run you through those three objectives. So number one, establishing our satellite populations, assurance populations, whatever you want to call them. Um, this is all done through translocation but with a unique captive husbandry component of it, which is why zoos are involved. Because why would you call up a zoo to say, hey, come out and help me miss that birds? That's not typically something you think about with you know, zoo skills. However, we do have very unique knowledge in captive husbandry. So um, it's a very simple method that isn't simple to accomplish, but we capture birds, band them, hold them for a period of time. We do health assessments, do more research samples on them while they're in holding. Once we have enough birds for our translocations, then we transport them to the island and release them. So all of our capture is done through mist netting. Um, the interesting thing about working on a tropical Pacific island is the forest conditions can be vastly different from year to year. Um, so these are all pictures from Saipan. Um, this one here on the left is in 2019, which was after back-to-back -back typhoons, um, Sudalor and Yutu. And the secondary forest that we used to trap in was very sparse and we were having a hard time um, catching birds. Um, so we actually relocated to this site over here on the bottom right, which is part of a, um, it's called the Sumba region. It's a upland mitigation um, wildlife protection area, which we don't normally trap there because we have to get permission, but um, this is primary forest and it's beautiful, but um, very hard to work in because we can't clear net lanes as easily because these are all protected um, plant species and stuff. Um, this top photo is actually what we were doing earlier this year um, when we were working on the Saipan reed warbler. Um, because these guys have such different habitat uses, um, we were able to do a lot of trapping just like on roadsides. Um, so vastly different trapping, but um, it's all in the snets. So once the field team catches birds, they are kept, um, they're put into a field transport box, kept there for just a little while, and then brought into our bird room, which is essentially a hotel room that we have removed all the furniture from and turned into a holding room. So um, we have these great little holding boxes, um, one bird per box, different boxes depending on the species. Um, so these are fruit dove boxes here with the cloth bag front. Um, we do have to get those birds in and out um, because we do have to gavage feed them. They take much longer to switch over to a captive diet. And we're holding those birds on average for seven days. So it's just not long enough for us to get them eating out of a food pan. Um, but the other birds, we are pretty much hands off once they go into the box, unless something's going on, we need to check on them. But um, we also banned um, every bird that comes in and that way um, if we do release them back at their capture site um, and they're recaptured we have that for our data um, but lots of lots of lots of husbandry work um, some species are a little more time consuming than others uh, gavage feeding fruit doves takes a while especially when you've got 20 plus birds um, collecting fan or flies for the fan tails also takes a long time but it's all a labor of love. Um, we also do a lot of health screenings and research um, for the birds, so um, for the project. So we're collecting daily weights, which is not only informs our husbandry of them, making sure that they're eating and thriving in the room, um, but it's also helpful for us to get some data on what these guys weigh. A lot of these species haven't had a lot of scientific 
study done on them. Um, it's mostly been population surveys and things like that, not a lot of hands-on stuff. So we're also getting more of the metric measurements. Um, we do fecal essays for um, corticosterone, looking for stress levels, parasites. Um, we even collect some feces for DNA analysis. Um, and then we do have a team of veterinarians. I'm gonna point out another person in the room, Dr. Sandy Wilson has also been on the trip um, as a veterinarian one year. So um, very thorough health checks, um, blood draws, all sorts of stuff. So um, now that we're working with some of the listed species, the list of samples that US Fish and Wildlife wants us to collect is a little longer than most, so um, we're getting to do a lot more sampling, and it's, it's really interesting. So once we've reached our trapping goals, um, because you know we want to maximize the number of birds we're taking up on the boat, um, the birds are loaded into these transport crates, which are the same ones that they get loaded into in the field. Um, we travel on boat usually overnight, then because there's, these are uninhabited islands, there's nowhere to dock. So the birds are transported over in dinghies, and then we get to strap them into backpacks and hike up to the release site. Um, and it's, it's a really great day to get to release the birds. Um, this little fruit dove wasn't quite sure about where he was going, but um, he did fly off successfully. So, just to show a little bit of our data of what we've been doing over the past, oh, math is hard, that many years. <laughs> um, so there have been 12 translocations of five species um, to uh, different sanctuary islands. So you can go through and you can see, um, like over 2008 and 2009, so split over those two years, we introduced 100 bridled white-eye to Surigan. Um, and then we introduced 74 golden white eye in 2011 and 2012 to Surigan, and so on. Um, the reason why I'm pointing out the Surigan birds to you is because that's the most um, post really survey data that we have. So remember, we released those bridled white eyes in 08 and 09. They did a 2012 survey of Surigan. So those 100 birds we released, they now estimated the population to be 2,000 to 4,000 birds. So we feel pretty good that that was successful. Um, they didn't get great population number, density numbers of the golden white, I bet they were seeing unbanded birds. So we do know that there was evidence of breeding. Um, and they also saw nest building of the Rufus fantail. Um, 2016, there was a brief survey on Bubon. It wasn't out there just to do bird population surveys. They were out there doing some other stuff, but they did notice unbanded Tinian monarchs and bridled white eyes. Um, and then 2022 were the first um, more intensive surveys. Um, and those were, again, on Guguan is where they did the surveys. Um, they heard fruit doves, um, and then they saw monarchs and fantails at their transect sites. And then on Alamogan, um, they were seeing unbanded birds. Um, and then they also saw bridled white eyes and Mariana fruit dove on Alamogan. And um, we didn't take those birds to Alamogan. Um, so the, the thought is that, you know, the birds just naturally migrated their, the way there from Guguan. Um, Guguan and Alamogan are not that far apart from each other. So you know, these birds made it out to these islands by flying a really long ways to get there in the first place, so they're more than capable of flying up the archipelago. We're just helping them along. So, um, yeah, it was really interesting to, to get that data back. So, we reached the end of the MAC program plan that was supposed to go through 2030. Um, in 2022. <laughs> we, we were able to get more birds um, up there than what they had originally thought when they set out the plan. So now we're kind of at this weird holding pattern while they reevaluate the plan and reassess what our next steps are. 
Um, so we are currently doing some methods years on these two federally listed species, the Nosa luna, uh, Nagaga carisu. Um, so in 2023, we were on Rhoda. Um, this year we were on Saipan working with the reed warbler and next year we're going back to Rhoda to work on the white eye again. So um, just working on methods, trapping methods, holding methods, diet, um, getting samples for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They want to make sure that we're collecting birds with a really robust genetic um, diversity if we're going to do translocations. So um, we're getting lots of samples from all over the islands. All right, um, hang with me guys. <laughs> so the other objectives, education and outreach. Um, we have an entire education team that comes out with us and that's all they do. Um, these are zoo educators, that's what they do. They do outreach and education about wildlife and conservation. So they do great jobs at it. They go to schools, they go to fairs, they go to libraries. We bring people out into the field and show them our field sites. Um, we also do internship programs with um, local um, school children and college students. Several, several of our um, interns have actually gone on to get jobs in the wildlife sector in the islands. So um, really great to see that that next generation is really um, <coughs> taking possession of the future of the wildlife on their islands. So it's really great. Um, and real quick, um, captive assurance populations. I'm not going to talk about this on a whole lot because this isn't going to be a part of the next MAC plan. Um, this was because we were worried that the translocations weren't going to work and we wanted to have captive backup plans. But what we're seeing with the translocations is going gangbusters. So they're not going to take the birds out of the zoos, but we're probably not going to be bringing more birds into zoos. So um, right now we do not have any Rufus Fantail or Tinny Monarchs in zoos, um, but we have a few of the wide eye species left um, and some of the doves. If you come out to the Cedric County Zoo, you can see them in our tropics building in these exhibits. Um, we do have the sea heck, we have the fruit dove and the golden white eye and our cocoa bird. And just a little quick about Cedric County Zoo's participation. So we've been sending people into the field since 2011. Um, We've had staff out there every year. There's been a translocation since then. Um, so far, we've sent six different staff members um, with our seventh person heading out next year. So, And we bred all three of the species that we held. Okay, I'm gonna play you a really quick video. Whoop. Too far. Um, this was a video put together by Cole Campbell from River City Visuals here in Wichita. My name is Anne Heitman. I'm the curator of birds at the Pacific County Zoo. My role at Pacific Bird Conservation is I am one of our bird trainers. When I okay. became a bird trainer at Pacific County Zoo, let's just close this.
Cole is very talented. <laughs> right. Okay. So, see you as Maasi. Thank you. Um, these are our partners. I want to make sure we get them acknowledged. But, um, does anybody have any questions? Switch over to this slide. Um, if anybody wants more information or to donate to any of these projects, here are some websites for you. Yeah. Being ignorant, why don't these birds go from island to island? They had to get there somehow in the mm -hmm. Pacific, so why aren't they going? Yeah, that stumps the biologists out there too. Um, why aren't they? And the best guess is that they don't need to just yet, um, or there hasn't been a storm that blew them up there, or, or what. Um, there are historical sightings of some of those species on those islands, um, so we just don't know why they aren't found in the Northern Islands, and they're only found on the Southern Islands. Um, and some of them are found on the northern islands too. So that part of the plan is, you know, we are only sending certain species to certain islands because they're already on some of the other islands. So um, I think it's just one of those quirks of nature, you know, <laughs> why they're on one island and not the other. Yeah. Are mosquitoes as big of an issue as Mariana says they are, like the native birds in Hawaii? 
Um, so as far as malaria goes, no, knock on wood. Um, in that video, you probably saw a lot of us wearing mosquito nets while we're out in the, the field. Um, we all were woefully unprepared for the amount of mosquitoes on Rhoda because we'd never seen a mosquito on Saipan. Um, so it's just really interesting, um, the differences, but as far as um, malaria being carried by the mosquitoes, that hasn't been a concern yet. It's certainly something that everybody's worried about could happen. <laughs> The only bird I've ever heard about on Guam is from pilots, and they talk about Juni birds. <laughs> and I was wondering, I doubt that any of these birds are in that category, but yeah. I was wondering if you knew anything about those kind of birds. I'm guessing that they're talking about chickens. Um, so on all of the that inhabited, of birds, yeah, in all the inhabited islands, there are feral populations of they call them boonie chickens. Yeah. I think I think in a lot of the islands, the boonie birds, I know on Midway and stuff, were albatross. Hmm. So when they, when they referred to the boonies, those were the albatross population. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know about there or Guam. Yeah, I don't know if there's ever been a recorded albatross out there or not? I've, not that I've heard of, for sure. But yeah. I'm sorry if I missed it. No. The first project you discussed in the relocation to the retreat state, mm -hmm. for your that program that you discussed at the end, was there a reason those birds were selected to be relocated? Um, because those are the species that were extirpated on Guam. So the worry is, because they're all small, forest dwelling birds, that they would be vulnerable to the snake if it established on those islands, the same way they were when it was on Guam. So that's why we're just trying to get ahead of any potential snake invasion, but also establishing extra populations for climate change and diseases and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> all the people that are going out there and all the transportation and that's got to be extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Who's paying for all that? Zeus. That's another key component of why they reached out to zoo professionals to do that. Um, AZA zoos specifically have a strong obligation through our accreditation to participate and fund conservation. Um, the goal is for it to actually be 3% of your operating budget. Um, even with everything that we do at Cedric County, um, we aren't quite hitting that 3% goal. Um, some zoos are, some zoos are not doing as close, but you know, I wouldn't expect a tiny zoo to do the same amount of work. Um, but I know we like to say like, oh, zoos do conservation. They really do. Um, and we're really bad about telling that story because whether it's sending staff out to do work or funding projects, or whatever it is, um, AZA zoos are funding a lot of conservation work around the globe. We're just kind of doing it silently for the most part, yeah. Yeah. Another one, I, I know that the kingfisher diet around the world is highly varied. Mm -hmm. what, what does the Guam kingfisher specialize in? What do you... um, they're terrestrial hunters, so they're mostly getting insects and small lizards. But will they eat a brown tree snake? <laughs> I don't know if we've ever recorded that happening. Um, maybe. I know our kookaburras certainly will, but they're a lot bigger than the, the Guam sea heck. Um, maybe if it was a small enough snake, I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah. With the whole nocturnality thing being, you know, theoretically, if that was a key source that they might prey on, and nocturnality being the, the snake would make that not necessarily as likely to occur. Yeah. For sure, yeah. You said there's another kingfisher on some of the northern islands, mm -hmm. but they're incompatible, or they would interbreed, or? Yeah, so they fill the same niche. They're both terrestrial hunters. They have the same prey. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're in the same genus, but I think it's just one of those things that's like better left avoided if possible. So yeah, it's that. White and blue collared kingfisher. Yeah, well, that, we've got yeah. kingfishers in mm -hmm. Dakota, South Texas. We've got three different ones that mm -hmm. get along. 
These islands are very small. Saipan is about the size of the greater Wichita area. You can drive around the whole island in an hour, depending on if you get stuck behind the slow moving vehicle. Um, so yeah, Guam is heavily populated. Rota is about 2,000 people, I think was the last estimate I saw. Tinian is like four to 5,000 people. Saipan is like around 20,000 people. So Saipan is definitely the most populated of the northern islands. And then everything up there, up north of Saipan, we consider to be uninhabited um, because there's no Utilities, no, you know, anything out there. There are Chamorro people who homestead out there. Um, and so like, depending on the census year, you might see that there's five people living on Olamagan, but um, we don't consider them to be inhabited. I don't know the population of Guam, but oh, well over 100,000. Other than military? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, massive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And check out those.